Hi, good morning. Um, on behalf of uh, Megan, I'm Ian Witterick uh, from the University of Toronto. Um, we'd like to invite up our esteemed panelists. Uh, we have uh, Dana Hartle from Gustav Rusi, Chief of Thyroid Surgery Unit. Uh, Nicola Avenia, Director General Surgery and Surgical Specialty Units from Turney, Italy. Claudio Cerneo, Professor and Chief of Surgery, University of San Paolo. Uh, past President of Brazilian Head and Neck Society. Daniel Rock, who you just uh, met as a, a moderator, Head and Neck uh, Cancer Surgeon from Duke University, North Carolina. Uh, Madan Capre from India, who's uh, been innovative and pioneered in many different societies in India. Uh, Met Duran, Professor and Director of Thyroid Surgery, Clinic of uh, Maslik, Asabatadam Hospital, Istanbul. Uh, Giovanni Dasimo from Associate Professor of General Surgery, University of Van Vitali of Campania. So Megan, do you want to start with the first two cases and then we're going to try to have a very interactive uh, panel. Please step up to the microphones if you have questions or want to ask during the presentations. Great, so we have a talented group of members on our panel and we have expertise from all over the world. And so I'm gonna give two cases and then my colleague is gonna present two cases as well. So the first case is a 50-year-old physician who has dysphagia and possible left thyroid lobe enlargement on exam. She sees her PCP and her PCB orders a thyroid ultrasound. There's a 1.6 centimeter inferior left thyroid nodule and a 1 by 0 0.9 by 0 0.5 centimeter hypoechoic solid nodule within the left aspect of the isthmus. So the larger 1.6 centimeter nodule is biopsied, and I'm just going to ask our panelists, and anybody could chime in. Um, so this is the ultrasound image. And as you can see, let me see if the right here is the smaller nodule. So it's right up against the trachea, it's sort of D-shaped and there's some uh, little hyperchoic punctate lesions. So anyone on the panel can chime in. Is this a nodule that you would biopsy or not? Yeah, I can't see it. That's, it's this, the one that's, you've got some, it's like right on the trachea. Yep. Is that what that is? Yep, but so it's, it's right on the it's, trachea. It's only hypoechoic. There's no real microcalcifications. It is sort of ugly. It has um, not very well-defined margins. Uh, it's once, uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I would probably want to get, I don't know, get one of those close-up ultrasounds, maybe, you know, see if you can't get some micro, see microcalcifications in there. Um, but we would probably not. If it's just hypoechoic, if there's just that, only that sign, we would probably not do that. We'd probably watch that. Please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to, to call your attention for the new classification of the American College of Radiologists. So uh, this should be uh, TIRADS 4, by definition, right, in the new classification. Well, what I find in uh, everyday practice is that sometimes with this change, with the classification, many more nodules are being uh, aspirated because they are considered TIRADS 4. Contrary to the previous classification, which in my opinion was better because you could stratify the T4, uh, the, I mean the TIRADS 4 in subcategories. Having said that, I think in many uh, centers this nodule would be biopsied because of the hypoechogenic uh, aspects, despite the absence of microcalcifications, irregular shape, etc., etc. One, one more comment, then I'll... I'm sorry, Megan, I thought you said, are, were there microcalcifications? It's harder. To see so, so this is it. So it's sort of D-shaped, so it's against the trachea, and there's what you'd call hyperchoic areas to it, whether or not it's microcalcifications or not, sort of hard to call. And, but it is a centimeter, so this is sort of... The concern for the physician was that it was against the trachea. Yeah, it, it looks a little bit irregular to me. I think I might buy up to it. So this patient did undergo biopsy of both the nodules. So the dominant 1.6 centimeter nodule was biopsied and was benign. And the one centimeter nodule was biopsied and was consistent with papillary thyroid cancer. She then underwent a total thyroidectomy with central neck dissection for what ended up being a 0.6 centimeter papillary thyroid microcarcinoma that had to be shaved off the trachea. 
There was extrathyroid extension, but no lymph node metastasis. She then went and saw nuclear medicine. Pre-treatment scan showed focal uptake in the central neck, consistent with thyroglossal duct remnant and right thyroid bed remnant. She had an iodine avid four millimeter right level two lymph node. So this is a little atypical. It's on the contralateral neck. And nuclear medicine treated her with 155 millicures of I-131. So a pretty high dose. So post-op, so this is a physician. She lectures to medical students. She also gives lectures at national meetings. And so she had issues with voice fatigue when giving lectures. She then saw ENT and was diagnosed with a mild left superior laryngeal nerve palsy. She underwent voice therapy and her symptoms improved. She also developed salivary gland inflammation after the radioactive iodine. This resolved. She also had a closed left nasolacrimal duct and she had to see oculoplastics, and this was treated. And so it's six years later, and she's now cancer-free and without complaints. And so the questions that come up for the panel is, and anyone can chime in, but thinking about this patient with a very small cancer, is this a patient who should have underwent surgery? In your experience, how do patients with superior laryngeal nerve damage typically present? Do you think superior laryngeal nerve damage is underreported? Because after all, this is a physician who was very sort of savvy and alert to what was going on. And in your experience, how helpful is voice therapy for superior laryngeal nerve damage? So this is where I really want to rely on our experts and what are their thoughts um, about this particular patient and then superior laryngeal nerve damage in general. Well, uh, in my opinion, the uh, injury to the superior laryngeal nerve, the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, is by far underreported. And uh, I would advise strongly the surgeons to actively look for it because uh, one out of uh, five patients uh, will have a nerve that is crossing exactly the region of the superior thyroid pole. And uh, I think everyone knows that I, I like to use nerve monitoring, so we've published about that. And nerve monitoring for the superior laryngeal nerve is as important as nerve monitoring for the recurrent laryngeal nerve, especially in voice professionals and especially in physicians. I don't know in your environment, but in Brazil, uh, physicians are high-risk patients by definition. So uh, uh, I would strongly advise uh, uh, a specific care for the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. I, I, I absolutely agree with, with Dr. Senea. Uh, especially because there are many surgeons that they, they even, uh, I mean, they know it exists, but they don't look for it. And I think that's a, a ridiculous thing to, to, to work with. I mean, you have to uh, routinely look for the superior laryngeal, I mean, to the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. And there are quite a lot of surgical maneuvers that could allow you to identify the, the nerve in the operating field. And I absolutely agree with Dr. Cernea. It's absolutely underreported the incidence of the, of the external branch of laryngeal, superior laryngeal nerve injury. But I, I think uh, surgeons should have a low threshold to use nerve monitoring in this, in this scenario. I, I, I think it has to be routinely performed in all patients because the, the post-op complications of a superior laryngeal nerve, especially in voice professionals and women, is, is really very unpleasant for them. So the, I would do want to ask the panel, so this you know, was a small nodule, it was one centimeter. It did appear to be against the trachea. Is this someone who should have went into surgery? You know, they had to be shaved off ultimately. Do you agree with that decision? Um, and then the other question is, you know, have you also found voice therapy to be helpful in these sort of individuals? Yeah, I okay. think I'm gonna go. do that. Um, if we consider, we couldn't see the images very well. If we'd consider that that was a U-Tyrads 3 uh, no, no, it's five, I'm sorry, that was hypoechoic with uh, irregular margins and microcalcifications. We didn't have irregular margins. Well, I don't, well, we couldn't really tell. Okay, well, if we did, and we did, we put a needle in it. Um, so it's my, this is micropapillary thyroid carcinoma in a female that's 50 years old. Uh, would this have been amenable to active surveillance is kind of the question. Um, and there's a really excellent paper by Professor Ito and his group that, that showed that when you've got micro, micropapillary that's on the trachea, if it's kind of round and it's sitting with, a, with just part of the circle of the tumor with a, a very uh, acute angle, 
to the trachea, then you have a low risk of invasion of the thyroid cartilage, but, of, of, excuse me, of the tracheal cartilage. However, this one was kind of sitting flat on the trachea, and in these cases, this is what they showed, was that they had more tracheal invasion than these kind of lesions. So these kind of lesions that are sort of sitting flat on the trachea um, are probably not good candidates for active surveillance. Excellent. And then what has been your experience with voice therapy for these sort of patients? Because this particular patient's doing great now. So if, my, if our colleague can answer from India, has voice therapy yeah. something that you would well, use? Well, in the uh, first place, the superior laryngeal nerve injury patients don't really present with voice change, but they present with cough and maybe microaspiration. Because as much as it is a tensor, it is also a, a sensory nerve for the supraglottis. And a lot of patients will present typically the next day that they are microaspirating and have a cough. I think the only treatment that we have to offer to them is, of course, uh, swallow techniques and voice therapy. And uh, again, I like to uh, highlight that uh, there is no efficient therapy for a complete injury to the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. So contrary to the inferior laryngeal nerve that you can do a medialization procedure, you can do whatever you want, uh, re-innervation. For the superior laryngeal nerve, there is no efficient therapy for a complete lesion. So this lady probably had an incomplete lesion. She, has a, a, she had a parisi that recovered probably with the therapy. In the original uh, paper that we presented uh, 25 years ago for the classification of the superior laryngeal nerve, in the original se clinical series of 104 patients, and we did a randomized uh, study, uh, two patients actually had a complete injury to the superior laryngeal nerve on the group that the nerve was not searched for, and uh, both, one of them was a voice professional, both of them had the permanent uh, decrease of the high frequencies spectrum of the voice permanent years after the surgery. So again, that for a voice professional, remember Amelita Gallicucci, she had to quit because of the operation she had in 1936. So pay attention, superior laryngeal nerve is dangerous. I mean, the injury can be very dangerous. So thank you. So we're fortunate to have such an expert panel on this topic. I'm going to transition to another case that's a little bit more complicated. So this is an unfortunate case. So this is a previously healthy 29-year-old woman who underwent a right thyroid lobectomy followed by a completion thyroidectomy at an outside facility. Um, she was found to have a 4.6 centimeter right-sided papillary thyroid cancer that extended to the margin with extrathyroidal extension and angiolymphatic invasion with additional papillary thyroid cancer foci in the left lobe, largest being 1.2 centimeter, and there was lymphovascular invasion. So her post-op course was complicated by laryngeal edema and pulmonary edema, right vocal fold paralysis, uh, left hemispheric stroke due to a PFO with right-sided hemiparesis, subsegmental pulmonary emboli, bilateral pneumothoracy status post chest tube placement, Klebsiella ventilator-associated pneumonia, C. diff colitis, core pulmonale, and ARDS. So very unfortunate case. She had this complicated post-op course and was in an outside um, hospital for quite some time and initially didn't receive radioactive iodine. Almost a year later, she received an I-131 scan and a SPECT CT, which revealed intensely focal neck activity localizing to a 1.5 by 1.5 centimeter soft tissue nodule on the left neck, thought to be residual tissue. There was no evidence of regional or distant disease. She received 100 millicuries of I-131. Um, due to her living conditions and her ventilator dependence, she was admitted to the hospital after radioactive iodine, and then she was subsequently discharged home. Um, since ultrasound's difficult because she has the tracheotomy, she has periodic CT of her neck and chest. There's no sign of recurrence. Her thyroglobin is in the 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 range, which is um, an indeterminate response. Eight years later, she still has the tracheostomy. She requires home oxygen for combined hypoxic and hypercarbaric respiratory failure. She sees pulmonary for pulmonary fibrosis status post her history of ARDS. 
She has pulmonary hypertension. She's on um, Zarelta for possible clotting disorder. So this is a very unfortunate case. This is a woman who walked in healthy. She was seen at a very a low volume facility. Um, she's now taken care of by her sister, um, and she had a two-year-old son at the time of her surgery. <laughs> so um, hindsight being 2020, my question for the group is, is there anything that could have been done differently? So she was seen in a low volume facility, but would it have made a difference if she was a high volume facility? You know, clearly she had some risk factors that she was unaware of. Is there any way to have prevented her hospital course? Any recommendation for pre-op evaluation? Um, in regard to her tracheostomy, do you think it's explained by the right side of recurrent laryngeal nerve injury? You know, is the left really intact, or do you think it's um, more complicated than this? And then what can we learn from this unfortunate case? Because it's so common that we talk about you know, single complications, but there are a few patients who have really unfortunate cases um, after their thyroid surgery. Uh, did she have any pulmonary background uh, diseases? N none known prior to this. So um, she's low income, lived in you know, sort of a, a, you know, an area where she didn't get a lot of medical care prior to this being picked up. Because it's very unusual for a young patient, 29 year old, right? Yeah. Uh, to Late have 20s. this kind of uh, outcome immediately after the operation. Regarding the tracheostomy, uh, uh, it's very unusual to have to perform a tracheostomy before, because of a unilateral vocal fold paralysis. So uh, I have two questions for you on this. Uh, number one, how sure are we that the contralateral vocal fold is completely normal? And number two, uh, was there any pulmonary studies done uh, to evaluate what kind of uh, respiratory insufficiency this patient has? Because if it's an obstructive insufficiency, tracheostomy uh, helps to, to solve that. But it's a diffusional insufficiency, meaning pulmonary insufficiency, mm -hmm. The tracheostomy is just for helping the ventilation, but uh, doesn't have anything to do with the operation itself. Right. So do you have answers So for that? most of her care has been outside, but those are some of the questions that came up is, is you know, is this truly just the right-sided? But then everything was so complicated with her, you know, that she decompensated all at once. And she even, you know, they went into, they considered doing, you know, removing this sort of 1.5 centimeter mass, but even to have a biopsy, she had some laryngeal edema and had to be admitted to the hospital. So she, um, she's someone that people are very reluctant to sort of do more on her. Um, and then she's had this slow recovery and clearly has pulmonary disease now. And so there hasn't been further investigation on the left recurrent laryngeal nerve besides the initial. I think the stroke probably weighed in quite a bit with the tracheotomy and the difficulty swap, maybe aspiration. It's really hard to tell without knowing the timing of all of this, but yeah, one side, and especially in a young patient, one injury to a recurrent nerve would not cause all of that. Well, I think what would could have done differently, because we're talking hindsight, is probably the second surgery where she went for a completion could have been probably done in a center where there is a high volume, little bit of more expertise, and it will be more work up done on her. Mm -hmm. This is number one suggestion I could say. And secondly, I think this tracheostomy was primarily because she was aspirating, that resulted into the pulmonary problems, that resulted into ARDS, that of course is tracheostomy. Mm -hmm. It has got nothing to do with a single cord palsy. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, one last comment. Um, the reason why it was a two-stage operation we don't know it yet, right? Because the first operation was for the 4.6 centimeter cancer, mm -hmm. and maybe the, per the surgeon may have realized that the nerve was not intact anymore, so maybe it was a purpose, on his purpose, to put it on the second stage. Was that the case? So it did not take because place at our facility. Yeah, so we don't know. We sort of saw her afterwards when she got the radioactive iodine. Yeah. So the, the second surgeon knew that it was? No, no. So this, all of the surgery took place at an outside facility within a close time frame. And then, you know, she was hospitalized there for a, an extended period of time, mm -hmm. then came to our facility to consider radioactive iodine treatment. 
Okay. Um, so s there are some details that are missing, but it's clearly one of the more unfortunate, you know, surgical complication cases that we've seen. So thank you. So we had some excellent uh, panelists here, and I'd like to hand it over to my colleague who has two additional cases that he's going to challenge them with. Thanks very much. Um, if we could have the uh, Witterick slides up, that's great. Now, none of us ever have complications, so these have never happened uh, to, to us or, or any of the panelists. So this is all theoretical, uh, of course. So. 42-year-old female, 2-centimeter right thyroid nodule, AUS, planned right lobectomy. And during the dissection, the, uh, one of the arteries uh, was, or an artery was thought to be the nerve, and the nerve was transected. Two clips were put on either side of it, then it was cut across. And then it was later on recognized that there was an injury to the nerve. So then... The question uh, for the panelists is uh, what to do. So you have the right recurrent laryngeal nerve there, traced up, and then you have this inadvertent injury and two clips on either side of it right now. So what are you going to do? We'll start with Claudio. Uh, was this uh, complication recognized at the moment of the surgery or only after that? No, very shortly afterwards. Not during the surgery? No, no, during the surgery. During was, the surgery, yeah. okay. So if it's possible, uh, I will try to do end-to-end uh, -end anastomosis. Uh, the end-to-end -end anastomosis of the recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, does not provide a normal function of the vocal fold because of synkinesis. However, it provides in the medium and long-term uh, term range a uh, avoiding the bowing of the vocal cord and offering a better rehabilitation, either with uh, phonotherapy and or surgery for that. Uh, in the case that it's impossible to do end-to-end -end anastomosis, we could try Professor Miaoshi well-known technique of answer to the distal end, to the distal stump of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. But I think in such a short segment, it would be quite uh, easy to do an end-to-end -end anastomosis. And Dr. Hartle, oh, sorry, yes, go ahead. I, I agree, I completely agree with Claudio. I think that we have a, tra a transaction in the OR and you have both uh, segments uh, that you can join them together. I will perform an end-to-end -end anastomosis. Although we have to know that probably that nerve will have, will have an aberrant renovation, we will uh, absolutely sure that uh, that vocal fold will be more robust and less atrophic. So I think that's, uh, in my opinion, what we should do. Because then afterwards we have another techniques we can do if that nerve is not uh, properly working. So do you think the nerve uh, just gets, uh, or not the nerve, but the muscle gets toned to it? Yes. Do you ever think it moves? At least, at least it's less atrophic, but I don't think it's going to work, obviously, as long as before. It's not going to work as it was a normal nerve. But I mean, if you have both, both uh, streams there, why don't you shoot to them? It's a, it's a pretty easy technique. And then in, in the future, if that nerve doesn't work, you can, you can do other things to that emilarynx. Now, now, for any of the panelists, what, what type of suture would they use? Would they get out a microscope? Are their loops fine? Would they call a friend because are you freaked out that the nerve's been cut and you're, you know, you're, you're shaking and you want your friend or, or what would you do, no. practically well, speaking? Huh? Okay. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because we are a high volume head and neck surgeon, we always have a plastic reconstructive surgeon friend handy. And I would probably get his help and they will be using something like 9-0 or 8-0 sutures and do an anastomosis right there before we extubate because thanks to Greg, we are all educated into IONM and we probably recognize that on the table and not let it happen afterwards. So in the same sitting, probably we'll go ahead with a micro neural anastomosis. This right. is eminently possible. Does everybody else on the panel agree or any different technique? Or? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree on that. I, we could probably do it ourselves because I mean, a lot of us are, you know, to microsurgery, but uh, would you resect? I, mean, I have a question, to everybody. Would you have you put clips on each end and then you cut it? Would you resect those crushed ends before? 
I would wonder. I, that's the question I would ask myself in the OR. Should you, should you resect the ends, but then is, it, then is your anastomosis going to be, uh, you know, maybe a little bit under some tension? Ab absolutely so. so uh, that's, um, I, uh, I think that the nerve, actually the distal part of the nerve degenerates, degenerates. So uh, the, the rest of the nerve, the stump of the nerve, is just a conduit uh, to orient the regeneration. As we, speak, uh, we spoke before, uh, uh, the reinnervation, the functional reinnervation, is impossible. But if you can uh, try to attain some bulk of the vocal fold, it's ideal for you to direct, to properly direct the re regeneration of the fibers, either with an end to end or with a uh, answer to end. Uh, yeah. That was actually my next question. Yeah, Thank e you, Dana. Either, either answer interposition or direct, I mean, that will make you feel good, but I don't think it will work. So it will probably, even if the voice will be fine after six months, it will be probably, most likely, due to the compensation of the contralateral side. I don't think that that we are doing, we, we have to do it. We cannot just leave right. the ends free, but yeah. I don't know. <laughs> now, uh, one of the attendants of nerve anastomosis is that it's tension free. And so presumably you're gonna cut the ends of where the crushed clips were, and then you're probably gonna have to mobilize the nerve to get length to it, uh, to be able to anastomose them together. Um, and then there's literature from the 1960s where on dogs where they cut the nerves reanastomose and they said, because of the synkinesis, dyskinesia, don't do it. But I think we've gone now to that if the nerve is cut, we should put it together. Is everybody in agreement with that? Or anybody in the audience disagree? They would leave it and then do something later? All right, good. Now, what about if um, you do a really big mistake or there is a tumor surrounding it and you're missing a lot of nerve length? So we've already heard about the ends of cervicalis coming in, but what about taking a nerve graft, a piece of greater auricular nerve or some of the cervical plexus, and doing an interposition graft? Or there's also nerve carriers, which are tubules where the nerve can grow along. So would you prefer the ANZA sort of repair nerve graft? So maybe we can have some discussion about that. Madden, what did you yeah, say? Yeah, well, I have a, a small reservation on the ANZA because it does will interfere with the functioning of the, the muscles of uh, bringing the larynx down, the sternothyroid and the sternohyoid. In our practice, we prefer, thankfully this doesn't happen often, but does happen when you are doing a cancer resection and you have a sizable length of uh, recurrent nerve missing, we tend to prefer great auricular because its size matches and the donor, uh, sorry, the, the place from where you take the graft has a very little handicap. I mean, this lobule which get anesthetized as a result of your great auricular, very soon get sort of a compensated and that disability is not too much. So we weigh the disability of the, the donor nerve uh, and we feel that great auricular gives a lesser disability than transecting the ANSA. Okay, does everybody agree with that, with the uh, disability from the ANSA transfer? Yeah, uh, Dan? I would, I would use ANSA. I mean, I think that it's so accessible. You're cutting a branch to one of the muscles or trying to size match it appropriately. Um, I, I don't think the disability, uh, from what I've seen, has been significant. And yeah, Claudio? Yeah, uh, I don't have experience with a different method, but I saw a French surgeon, I, I don't recall exactly from where he's from, but he, had, he showed in the American Laryngological Association Congress 10 years ago, eight years ago, a very interesting technique. He has a huge experience with bilateral, bilateral tracheostomized patients, bilateral vocal fold paralysis. And with re bilateral re with part of the phrenic nerve. I never used that, but he showed some astonishing results and he could actually decannulate, I don't know, 60, 70 percent of, of the patients who were already for years, these are chronic injuries, for years under tracheostomy. So I don't have experience with that, but I think it's exciting. I think we're a little bit uh, different here in, in thinking. I'm not saying that we'll use this uh, great auricular nerve only as a cable, 
But when we can't do as a cable, then that ANSA proposition is perfectly uh, fine. And we change over from ANSA to great auricular or a cable grafting with a, a, a debate we used to have between the endoscopic thyroid surgery vis-a-vis -vis conventional thyroid surgery and the voice changes after endoscopic thyroid surgery were slightly attributed to the <coughs> malfunctioning or transecting the, the, supra, uh, the sternothyroid muscle and they don't they used to re, re, the, re suture them. And as a result of that, after the endoscopic thyroid surgery, they will have a different quality of voice vis-a-vis -vis when you have a conventional where we are not dissected or transected the, the muscles. I think that's where we took a clue from and we changed our technique from putting it the great auricular. That was the logic of uh, changing over from ANSA, which is eminently next to you, but great auricular nerve is not very far away as well. Just extend a little bit and it's there. Okay, we're going to do audience participation. You have four choices. You're going to leave it alone. You're going to do a cable graft. You're going to do an ANSA. Or you're going to call a friend because you don't know. Okay? <laughs> Number one, who's just going to leave it alone and do a thyroplasty later? <laughs> who's going to do a cable graft? Yeah. Who's going to do an ANSA cervical transfer? Oh, oh yeah. ANSA's winning. Who would call a friend because they're not sure? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for being honest. Okay, so ANSA won on that one uh, uh, with that. Great. Let's go on to a, a different problem, a very common problem. We heard outstanding lecture on this by Dr. Tully. And I just want to get some practical advice from the panelists. So here you have a 55-year-old patient, papillary thyroid, total thyroid, bilateral central neck. Um, both superior paras were preserved and the surgeon thought they looked viable. There was nothing wrong with them. There's no special fluorescence or dye studies done. The inferior parathyroid glands were not seen and were thought to have been included into the central neck dissection. So we think there's only two functioning parathyroids, or there's two parathyroids present, but we're not sure they're functioning um, with that. And so the, the question is, is calcium management. So afterwards, you think there's a chance this patient may go hypocalcemia. So let's just start off with that vitamin D loading ahead of time. Uh, who on the panel vitamin D loads just by a show of hands beforehand? Do you, do you base it on a vitamin D level or do you just sort of do it? I base it on the uh, preoperative vitamin D level which I sample routinely before the surgery. Well, right. I just do it. You, you live in a place where you have lots of sun. When Paris in the winter is kind of gray. It's very pretty, but it's very gray. And so we started out dosing vitamin D and found out, I think that Dr. Tolley said also in the UK, 95% uh, of our patients did have uh, a deficit. So we just do it routinely. Just, um, and it's not active vitamin D. It's just regular vitamin D about two weeks before surgery for total thyroidectomy. So what sort of doses were you using? Because he was mentioning 20,000 units, which is quite high. Uh, weekly, so what do you use? It's just, actually we have a thing called this UV dose, and I'm not quite, it's just um, the 25-hydroxylated, uh, I think is what it is, and it's um, 100,000 units in one dose. Okay. So, but, it's, but it's not the active vitamin D, it still has to be hydroxylated by the kidneys, so it's still subject to regulation by the, by the um, organism, and so it's by your, by your body, so it's not going to give you high uh, vitamin D levels. By show of the audience, how many people uh, give uh, vitamin D ahead of time before a total thyroid or completion thyroid with that? And do you base it on, how many base it on uh, blood tests versus just routine? So who's blood test and who's just gives it routine? Okay, so the most we're doing blood tests. That's very interesting. Okay, now what I wanted to get here is um, there's various means of managing calcium. So some just give everybody calcium uh, no matter what they do. So for completions or totals uh, as a means to get the patient out and then you're dealing with getting them off of it later on. Some people will do PTH levels, either recovery room or later that day. Uh, and have protocols for that. Others just watch and see if they're going down. And so what I want to I, I sort of get uh, from our panelists is, do you routinely measure PTH at your hospital and do you have an algorithm for when you would start replacing uh, that sort of thing? 
So we'll start on the end. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, my algorithm is just to check regularly after total thyroidectomy, not, not lobectomy, after total thyroidectomy, PTH in the recovery room. And uh, according to the level, we decide how much active uh, vitamin D should be given together with calcium. And how did you decide on what level it would be? Did you do a study? My, or low, it... my level is 15 yeah. uh, picogram. But we should also know that, um, that the next morning it will, be, it will go down to 7. It will go down 50%. Right. So uh, 15 is not the proper, uh, actually, the threshold. It will go down in the next morning due to the edema or whatever. Because one of the points I was hoping to bring out is that I think different hospitals have different uh, methods of doing PTH and have different machines. And even uh, within Toronto, the hospital beside or across the street from us gets different levels uh, than we do. So I think you have to know it on your individual hospital machine. And I, so that's one of the things I think would be is, is useful is to know what it is at your hospital. Claudio, you have insights in that? Uh, yeah, our experience in our hospital is a little bit different than that. Uh, our cutoff, uh, and it's very, very critical to uh, properly uh, collect the sample, which is one hour after the extraction of the specimen in our experience. So it's actually uh, sometimes, uh, depending on the operation, uh, in the recovery room or eventually if you have to do anything else, uh, uh, even in the OR. But the one hour timing is very important. And at least in our experience, uh, it doesn't decay so much. So uh, in our hands, 12 is a very cut off point. If it's below seven, it's uh, very indicative that you have to replace not only calcium, but also rocotrol. You have to give both. And uh, uh, if it's above 12, very rarely these patients will develop uh, hypopara anyway. And I'd like just to mention that in our experience, and Dan and, and I, we, we had this discussion a couple of times already, but in our experience, if you are doing central neck compartment dissection, the incidence of the frequency of hypoparathyroidism, at least temporary hypoparathyroidism, goes much higher than the regular total thyroidectomy. I know that we have a disagreement on that, but uh, this is in our hands. So uh, uh, if this patient is going to undergo a uh, elective, I never do elective, a therapeutical central neck dissection, I think the chances are much higher for at least a temporary hypopara. Madden, you had a comment? Yeah, I got a, a different angle to all these measurements of post-operative parathermon. Uh, but before I go into that, just a quick thing about our country and our setup where we do the PTH. The most important factor is that most of the centers will not have a facility of doing PTH in the same institution. The sample will go somewhere else for central processing. And during that transit time, we lose a lot of uh, parathermal, which is in picograms. In, it's very, very heat labile. So we came up with a new working up of our system. We did about 118 patients. And we have come up, and the paper is in print, that even if it is measurable, which is three, this patient is going to do well. And this is a factor we factor it in because the specimen of the blood sample gets really not substandard by the time it goes for examination. So even if it is measurable amount of PTH in the sample, we are happy. As regards to the post-operative management of uh, calcium, again, the, the money comes into it. We only monitor calcium. We don't monitor PTH. We have two criteria, those who come up with clinical presentation of symptom, and there we treat them as if they have been knocked off, and those who do not have symptom will still go home with a, a calcium support for six weeks, and call them after six weeks. Those who will go, those who have symptoms, we have a different plan for them. Now, does everybody measure serum calcium, ionized calcium? Do you rely on one or the other, or should... Because, it, you know, it's more expensive to do serum and ionized uh, together, or, or what would you do? What do you look at? Or is it your residents who do it and you don't know? <laughs> total total okay. calcium the next morning. Total? Yeah. Yeah. Just before discharge. Does anybody rely on ionized calcium? Mm -hmm. 
No, I would do iodine, yeah, we'll ionized if it's a patient who's, that we're, we're checking that's on, that, that already has hypoparathyroidism, hypoparathyroidism that's been discharged. I tend to look at that maybe a little bit more closely. But on day one, I would just do total calcium and, pro, and look at albumin. Uh, also, because these patients have um, hemodilution from the, all the IV that they've had to, so you have to be careful of correcting that calcium. Right. That's uh, one of the reasons that we've sort of switched over to looking at ionized calcium more as the uh, as our standard for what, for what we do. How many people do uh, would prefer just serum calcium, and how many would do ionized calcium, or and then three who does both? So who does serum calcium only? Ionized calcium. Who does both? Okay, so a lot of both uh, <laughs> with bad. that as well. Yeah, I'm not sure, because I, I know that I look at the serum calcium, and I look at the ionized calcium, and then I go, well, they're both sort of showing the same thing. So I wonder, could we get rid of, of one? But I, I, I can't say that we actually have. We keep ordering both <laughs> in practical terms. Now let's hear from an expert endocrinologist. Is what would you like to see us do postoperatively in terms of management of these patients who are going hypocalcemic. Well, our surgeons manage everything. Uh, to the microphone. Our surgeons manage everything perfectly. We don't have any problems with uh, hypocalcemia. Go to Michigan. <laughs> go to Michigan for your surgery. Uh, no, I mean, they have a, uh, our surgeons have a protocol in place, and so I think it's not exactly the same as what we heard from Dr. Tolley, but it's very similar. Right. And so, you know, for most of the patients during the immediate post-op period, they're managed well by the surgeons. And then, you know, in the rare cases that there's hypoparathyroidism, we end up managing them, them long-term. But um, overall, they have a system that works well. So. Right. How many people have a system in their hospital that it's sort of an automatic, if they're this level, they start on IV, this level, they start on oral? Anybody have a standard sort of protocol, or do you just sort of wing it? Most people wing it? 